Hi, thank you for joining us today for our webinar. We have Jimmy from Sawgrass here to host it for us. He's our manager of education. And I hope you all enjoy. And you know, if you have any questions, he always does take that at the end. So go ahead, Jimmy. Awesome. So glad to be here, Danielle. And today we're going to be focusing on how to sublimate ceramic mugs. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of different approaches for this and a few little tips and tricks here and there. So uh, just sit back, tune in, see what you can learn. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, and I will add that the Pro World staff, Danielle, of course, included in that, uh, has a great working knowledge of how to actually do these same types of processes. So they're always there available to help you out as well. In fact, Danielle has some videos online that I saw uh, demonstrating some of the processes. So good resource team there at Pro World. Uh, and with that said, let's get talking about sublimating ceramic mugs. Now, so Sublimated ceramic mugs are really a top seller. It's, it's a great product. It, it really and truly is a great product for sublimation. Uh, we can do personalized gifts. We can do promotional products. Uh, we can even do award products using mugs. So it's a good all-around type of product. Now, the challenge, of course, is that a mug is round. And most of the things that we do with sublimation are flat. So obviously, that mug will not fit in your flat press. Or if it does, you're going to crush it in the process. So that's not an option for getting it done. But we do have some good options for getting it done, and we're going to look step by step at a couple of them here in our presentation. Now, our standard mug production options include a mug press, probably the most popular, most uh, well-known way to do it, uh, mug wraps, which involve wrapping the mug with a, a special device and then putting in a convection oven, and then the 3D heat press. And the 3D heat press is a pretty unique piece of equipment as well. Uh, and that is something that Pro World carries. Not all the dealers out there carry uh, 3D heat presses, but Pro World does. Okay, so we'll take a look at some of these presses too along the way as we're talking about the different um, applications. Okay, so let's start off with the mug press process. Um, with the mug press, obviously it's a press designed specifically for a mug. Uh, you can also do some other rounded items in there because it's adjustable in size to a certain degree so it can hold some different products. So the steps start off with, of course, creating your image, creating your artwork. Now to get it set up right, you could just simply sit down and measure the area that you can sublimate on the mug. You could use a tape measure and do that. Uh, it's a little bit easier if you see if the mug manufacturer or if the distributor of the mug, such as Pro World, actually has a product template for that. Because I know a lot of you do use CorelDRAW, Photoshop, Illustrator, etc. So if you're able to get a product template into your uh, graphics program, then that helps set the workable area of that particular mug that can be imprinted, and that of course helps you set up your artwork. Now if you're a Creative Studio user, we have several excellent mug templates in the Creative Studio system, and you can see that's on what's on the screen right there, is a screenshot out of Creative Studio. I know it looks kind of weird where we're working with the artwork, but you really can't formulate your artwork around a curve on the screen, so we actually set it up as a rectangle that demonstrates uh, where the boundaries would be for that specific mug. And we have templates for a lot of different types of mugs. So those are good quality working um, templates based around true products. So we're going to set our image up first of all. And, and keep in mind too when you look at these, um, with a mug and sublimation, you can't get in that area underneath the handle. Okay, so the reality is if you're doing full bleed as in a, a colored background, you're going to have a white streak there where the handles are. But I mean that you see that a lot. Okay, that's just you know one of the limitations of the process. Uh, but other than that, we can get pretty much all of the outer mug area with our artwork. Once we have that done, we're going to print that out. Now, you can use standard paper if you wish. And a lot of people just end up using, say, 8.5 by 11, and then, then they go and, and trim it later, as you'll see in the next uh, couple of slides. Um, but I will mention that there are several different sizes of transfer paper. And there is a mug paper. Uh, and you may be able to use some other different sizes you know, for that type of application. Totally up to you. Also, make sure you print the image in reverse. Okay, So that's an important aspect 
of it. Uh, if you don't do it in reverse, and just get to print it over again when you figure out the mistake. Now, if you're using a standard type of paper like 8.5 by 11, you will need to trim it. And you can see here, uh, using a cutting board, uh, a straight edge, and an exacto knife or razor or whatnot, you know, that's being trimmed down because we want to trim that paper down to fit, you know, the dimensions of the mug there. Uh, again, as I said, there are some mug specific papers and for using those, you'll virtually eliminate the need for trimming. But it's totally up to you. There's some versatility here uh, and that's why we're pointing it out. Now, I will tell you, if you do a lot of mug production, you really should buy mug paper. Okay? Because if you really think of what paper costs, paper can be fairly expensive in the grand scheme of things, so you want to utilize the paper is what we're trying to say here. Uh, and if you actually were buying a um, one of the Virtuoso printers, the SG400, SG800, you can get what's called an option tray, which means you can have multiple paper sizes feeding that printer. So what I'm getting at is if you do a lot of mugs, you may have an option tray, and the option tray is set for mug paper, and then your other standard tray is set for whatever you use on a regular basis. Uh, and, and just to be clear, the paper trays are adjustable in size. So if you only have one paper tray, you can adjust the size of it down to fit mug paper too. So don't feel like that you have to get something special for this. Uh, just adjust it down to whatever size you need it to be. So once we do have the right size for our transfer paper, we do need to attach it. Uh, traditionally, most people use what I call heat tape, uh, and they put a little strip on each end of the paper. Now, I've been experimenting some with spray adhesives, and some of them work better than others, I will say. Uh, the, the key for you is to experiment as well. You want to find a spray adhesive that is a temporary spray adhesive, much like screen printers. I know some of you are screen printers, much like what screen printers use on the platens of their screen printing press. The idea is that it's just a light tack, and it holds the paper firmly to the surface. And it's... It, Definitely are some out there that when you use them, they will not interfere with the image whatsoever. And there's other ones that may. Okay, so that's why I say experiment a little bit. Um, I've been using an Albatross um, spray that works very well for these types of surfaces. But tape is fine too along the edge. Okay, the, the, little, the short edges there. You can see the strips going right here where the hands are and then out the opposite end. But for sure, if sometimes you will find with mugs that the surface of the mug is, is a little bit uneven. You really can't see it per se. Um, and if it's uneven in any way, your paper may not be firmly against the surface, which could cause you know, issues with the image. So being able to use a spray adhesive, you can really force the paper down tight against the uh, surface. But again, you do need to experiment with that, so make sure it doesn't affect the quality of the image. Okay? So don't just run out and start spraying and think it's going to be perfect. Experiment. Okay? All right, uh, so once we get our paper ready to go onto the mug, um, our next step is to really line this up okay, and center it out. Uh, in this particular case, we place the mug right in the center of the paper. And remember, there's tape on each edge. So the idea now is that we're going to pull up one side of the paper and we're going to attach it to the mug. And then we're going to pull up the other side and attach on the other side, making sure it's firm. It's got to be right up against uh, the surface of that particular mug very important aspect. Somebody always asked me again the brand name of the adhesive spray that I have used. It's Albatross. Albatross like the bird. Okay, I don't remember off the top of my head which um, exact product it is. Um, I, if you email me, my email is at the very end. I'll, I'll give you a, a product number. Uh, but you can try it. There's a lot of different ones out there. The, the main thing is to find something that works. Okay, so again, I just want to be clear on that experiment a little bit. Okay, so we're going to wrap that paper tight. It's got to be tight. Okay, it's very, very important, especially with mugs, that the paper is very tight against the surface. Um, if not, it can allow some of the gas to actually just spew out from under the paper and can leave a streak, and we don't want that. So it's got to be good and firm against the surface of the mug. We also recommend that you add what I call a blowout sheet uh, on top of the transfer paper. Uh, that may be a sheet of Teflon. Uh, it may be um, 
you know, butcher paper, that type of product. So there's there's some different things, and we normally use this type of thing with sublimation anyway. So anybody that's already sublimating, you, you understand what the purpose of the blowout sheet is for. Uh, but for those of you who are new to this, the purpose of it is to make sure that no sp stray sublimation gas gets onto the heating element of the heat press, because if it does, then it gets transferred to the next product. By the same token, if something did get onto the heating element surface, we want to make sure it doesn't transfer onto the product that's already in there. So that's what it is, is for protective purposes. People that do mugs a lot will actually take a sheet of Teflon many times and trim it down to fit mugs better than using a big full sheet of it. Okay, uh, So one way or the other, we do want to add our blowout sheet. And there are alternatives like butcher paper, craft paper, newsprint, those types of things too that can be used. Then we need to set up our press. Okay. And if we look at our press, there's there's there are variables. This is where you have to read the instructions. Okay, um, the the time is typically anywhere from two to four minutes. The temperature is typically anywhere from 380 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and our pressure needs to be a good, firm, solid pressure. But definitely read the directions. Okay, different um, mug presses may have different settings. Uh, also, different mugs themselves. Sometimes a mug manufacturer will give you very specific settings for their particular mug. So take some time to read it. Don't assume this. I'm just giving you just a ballpark figure here. Uh, this is not where I want you to go run and program into your heat press. I want you to read the directions for that. Okay. Uh, and keep in mind, too, that different products may have different settings. So even though you're using product A uh, day in and day out, when you suddenly switch to product B, it may require some different settings. So again, read the recommendations recommended um, instructions for a particular product. So once we have it ready, we're going to put it into the heat press. We're going to hit the start button and off it goes. And as you can see well, on those settings, ceramics normally do take longer. Okay, Ceramics, they really, it takes a lot of heat being applied to fully heat it up. Okay, think of it as like a black hole for heat. It just keeps sucking heat in. So ceramics, we do apply a lot more um, time for pressing than we do with many of our other products. So there's nothing abnormal about that. You just may not be used to those particular numbers. All right, once it's done, it's pretty hot. It absorbed a lot of heat for a long period of time. Uh, it is important that you pull the paper off immediately while it's hot. Now, you got to love the photo here. This photo was staged because this uh, person is not using a glove while they're holding the handle of the mug. Um, the handle won't be as hot as the base or the rest of the mug, I will tell you that. But it's not recommended you use your bare hand to pull it out. Okay, So just keep in mind, sometimes when we're taking pictures for things, um, we you know, stage a few things just so it's easier for the camera. Okay, So don't follow that little direction there of the bare hands on it. It's not good. Okay. But you definitely want to pull that paper off while it's hot. This is a hot peel process. Pull it off quickly and cleanly. Now you got a mug that's really hot that will not cool down very fast. You know, it took a long time to heat it up. It's going to take a long time to cool it down. Uh, many people will simply take a container of what I say room temperature water and they'll dip the mug in there. And it will immediately cool the mug down and stop the gassing process. It does not hurt the sublimation. This is very standard. Now, I will tell you, after you dip a few mugs, that water gets pretty darn hot. Uh, so we say room temperature water. Definitely do not use cold water. Okay, you don't want to use cold water. You want room temperature up through warm. You know, even hot is cooler than what the mug is. But you will need to periodically change that water out because it will get really hot over time. Don't use cold water. Okay, uh, you can also place on a cooling rack. You know, that's another alternative. Sometimes people take out these cooling racks that are used. Um, with cooking, and they'll lay their mugs out on that, and they'll let it air cool. But I'll tell you, as long as that mug is super hot, you know that sublimation is actually in an active state, uh, and we call it a gassing state. You don't see gas coming off of it, but you want to cool it down so that the gassing completely stops. Dipping in the water, good way to go. Doesn't hurt anything for you to do that. And then you're done. And your product's ready to deliver. We got to dry it off, okay? Uh, but now you're hopefully ready to go and deliver the product. So that's how we do it with the mug press. This is pretty simple, pretty standard. Uh, you have to buy the mug press, and I'm going to show you some mug press options too, because there's some other things we got to talk about. Because so far we've talked about a standard cylindrical mug. Uh, what about tapered mugs? Well, we'll get to that in just a minute. Now we have another product called a mug wrap, and a mug wrap. The first few steps we're going to go through here are identical to setting up for 
um, a mug press. But the product itself that we're going to use, the mug wrap, is a bit different. So if we take a quick look at those steps, we're going to create that artwork, same as we did before. We're using a wrap. The first um, preliminary steps are exactly the same. Uh, we're going to print the paper out in reverse and you know, using whichever size paper you prefer. Trim it down again to fit the mug, just like we were looking at before. So, so far, like I said, these steps are identical up to a certain point. Uh, we're still going to use some type of adhesive, whether it's tape or spray, to apply the paper onto the mug itself. We're going to center it up on the mug. We're going to wrap it up um, all the way around with the transfer paper and get it securely in place. And we're still going to use... A blush. I know I went through that fast, but we just saw all that. Okay, now here's where it starts to change. Those first few steps are the same. Okay, so you're holding your mug. It's all wrapped up. It's ready to go. But instead of putting in the heat press, what we're going to do is we're going to add another wrap around it. Now, wraps come in different shapes and sizes and configurations, but typically a wrap is designed to fit a specific mug product and has some type of latch on it that can be tightened down. So we want to, and this is the particular wrap I'm showing you. There's other wraps out there that have different configurations for how they latch, okay? Uh, this is just the ones that I have pictures of uh, for showing you how it works. So we're going to join the two ends of the wrap together, hand tight, and make sure everything is straight and snug against the mug. And it's very important that, you know, equal pressure is applied all the way around. Now, the manufacturer will tell you how to tighten it. This particular one, they tell you to use a drill. Okay, with like a um, a bit on the end for that that's a nut driver to tighten it down. But other ones are just hand tight or maybe with a screwdriver tight or whatever. It depends on who made the system. So read the directions. Okay. The point is the wrap has to be tight because if it's tight, it pulls the paper tight against the surface. Okay. So we've got this thing wrapped and, and ready to go. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a convection oven not a microwave oven, we're going to use a convection oven. And the settings for that convection oven are a good bit different than what we used on the press, mainly in the time. 12 to 15 minutes is what's going to happen on the convection oven, typically 400 degrees Fahrenheit, even though from time to time. The wrap manufacturer will give you directions of how to use the wrap and what the ideal settings are, and also pay attention to whoever made the mug. They may give you some recommendations as well. All right, but 12 to 15 minutes. But the neat thing is I can put multiple mugs together in one oven, okay? And it's not 12 to 15 minutes per mug. It's 12 to 15 minutes, period, whether there's one mug or five mugs. So... If you're going to do a lot of mugs, you're better off to have a decent sized convection oven so you can put multiples in there and do them you know, uh, all together as a group as opposed to doing one at a time with your mug press. just depends on what you need to do. Okay, So those are the kind of settings we're going to use there. So typically, the most of them recommend that you put the mug in upside down into the convection oven, keeping in mind that you can do multiple ones as long as they all fit. Each one has to have a wrap. You see the wrap that's in place. By the way, again, it's a convection oven. It's not a microwave oven. It's a convection oven. They're very different. You want to keep that part in mind. All right, so we're going to place it in there upside down and to cook it, as I say. Uh, this is the curing process, and away we go. And when it comes out of here, it's the same thing as when it comes out of the press. You pull it out, and you quickly pull that paper off while it's hot. And then go ahead and dip it in some water and cool it down. So you see the majority of the steps are the same. The difference is the device that's used for the heating process. Okay, that's where the big difference is between these two processes there. Uh, so there we go. That mug is complete and we're ready to move on. All right, so while we're talking about wraps, it's worth mentioning. See, the wrap thing is, I'll say it's fairly new in the industry. Uh, the reality is initial wraps were really just for mugs. Okay, It was an alternative to be able to maybe mass produce some mugs. But now we've seen some manufacturers come out with what we call, I call big wraps. And the big wraps can be used for interesting things like you can see the pet food bowl uh, or the cookie jar. So there are some other rounded objects that are fairly large, or should we say curved objects, where we use a larger wrap. Same kind of concept as we were using for a mug, except it's just a different size wrap. Okay, uh, So that is something that's available out there in the marketplace, just to make you aware of, uh, that you can go beyond mugs with the wrap kind of system. Okay, 
Well, what about tapered mugs? Well, what I've been talking about is your standard coffee mug. You think about your standard mug. Your, your standard mug is a cylinder. If you look at a tapered mug, it's not. So a latte mug is an example of a tapered mug. And, and you can see how the edges, you know, it are, are tapering in as you approach the bottom. Uh, that's not going to work in a standard mug press. That's not going to work with a standard wrap. How are we going to handle that? Because these are quite popular. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to have to pay special attention to both the artwork and the pressing to get this done. Because if you just try and put standard paper, you know, with a standard image and wrap it around, it's not going to happen. It's going to, it, it, you can't do it because of the angled nature there. Okay. So let's look a little closer here. If we think first, first thing is the mug press itself, a standard mug press. So a standard mug press has a cylinder, and we can see the cylinder in here. It has a cylinder, the heating elements in that cylinder, and the mug slides in. You see there's actually a little slot here where it slides in where the handle's sticking out. Okay, so it's built to understand we got a handle, and you put it in, and then you tighten this down so it, it tightens very well around this. I know my image makes it look a little tapered. This is supposed to be a cylindrical mug, okay? That's just the, the imaging um, in PowerPoint. So within reason, we can put most coffee mugs in there, and we can put things such as water bottles in there, provided that we can tighten this down enough to fit the water bottle. Different water bottles come in different diameters, so don't assume that every water bottle will fit your mug press. You, you do need to check that out, okay? But as you can see, this will work great for these types of products, but not for the tapered one, okay? The tapered one's a little trickier, all right? Now, one of the neat things that Pro World has is they have a mug press that has different heating elements available to it. And this is a standard you can see as a cylindrical, but they also have ones that are tapered for a couple of different sizes of the latte mug. Uh, so now that you have the ability here to switch out one heating element for a different heating element, that means that you can do the tapered mugs. Sometimes these are called funnel mugs too, by the way. I do hear them refer to as funnel mugs. Uh, but one way or the other, you have to make sure that the heating element fits against the surface firmly. If it doesn't, you're going to have problems. So this is pretty cool. It's a three-in-one press because it's actually got three different heating elements with it, uh, and that becomes a great solution for dealing with you know, tapered products. Now, there's also tapered mug wraps. So this is a totally different looking wrap than what we saw earlier, but having the ability again to wrap the tapered mug because we've got to pay attention to that shape. So there are some tapered mug wraps uh, as well. And then we got to think about the artwork. So it's not just the mechanics of the heating, it's also the mechanics of the graphics. Now this is a shot from Creative Studio. And what's going to happen is the artwork is set up, and there's a bleed area here to be for a tapered product. And then once it prints out, you're going to take scissors and you need to cut it along the boundary lines so that it matches up to the shape of that mug once we wrap it around the mug. Now, if you don't use Creative Studio, that's okay because many of the mug manufacturers also provide templates for their products so that you can use their templates to help you set up the artwork. Uh, and I believe that for the uh, latte mugs that Pro World carries, for example, that they do have templates on their website that you can download to help you set up. But you got to get the art right or it's not going to match up to that tapered shape. So that's just as important as having the right heat source uh, to be able to deal with the tapering. So tapering is sort of a special type of process. Uh, keep that part in mind. But as long as you understand that, it definitely opens up the doors uh, for you to be able to do a wider variety of products. Well, then we have the 3D heat press. And the 3D heat press is a pretty unique device, uh, fairly new in the marketplace. The 3D heat press was created for curved items. And the, the concept here is that you're able to use a combination of vacuum um, and heat to force your transfer papers to 
uh, mate up with a curved edge okay so a mug is a great example because it's curved right but even going beyond mugs when you talk about some of these cell phone covers where people don't want to just do the flat main body of the cell phone cover but they want it to go all the way around the edge because some of them are one piece covers that uh, they have sides as well as that main body area there and so your image needs to curve over those sides and, and around the sides so there are other products besides just mugs that you might use this for at one time uh, but the neat thing is heat press here will allow you to do multiple products. Uh, in this case, depending on the size of the mug, you could do up to 12 mugs at one time. So you're getting that type of production out of it um, where, you know, when you compare it to something like a convection oven, uh, to me this one's easier, okay? And we are getting that, you know, production going. Um, if you only need to do onesies and twosies, then you're probably okay with your mug press, okay? Uh, or maybe you have both, I don't know. Um, but this is definitely new, and it's something that you might consider as well when you start looking at what type of unit am I going to buy to support my mug press production. So it's one more option that we have out there in the marketplace uh, that you can work with. Okay, so that really covers mugs. I mean, mugs, mugs aren't difficult to do the biggest challenge on a mug that I have found is making sure that I have that transfer paper firmly against the surface firmly against the surface now I was looking over the pro world site earlier and the thing about pro world is keeping in mind besides the fact that they they're the ones who've sponsored this particular presentation is that on their website they have a lot, all these different types of tools that we've been talking about uh, whether you need printers heat presses substrates or whatever and they even had some kits that included you know these different things for you to be able to do the mug production the right way they also had some pretty good training videos and instructions and that's good because having that place to go to to get that information that you need it's all right there at your fingertips so keep that in mind uh, so anyway that kind of brings me down here to the end and, and I'm gonna bring Daniel back I see we have questions coming in already I like to share with you my email address where if you have questions of me you certainly can and I went ahead and put Daniel's up there too so you know if you have questions of her uh, that's how you can contact her or you can give the folks over there at Pro World a phone call to help you out wherever you need it so Danielle are you there I am here. Excellent. Um, so I don't, I don't know how much you have used the 3D heat press. It's something I haven't had a chance to use very often. So I, I just want to see if maybe you have some of the comments on that. Plus the fact I know you do a lot with mugs. And so any other tips and tricks you want to share, great opportunity to do that. I have worked with the 3D vacuum press uh, quite a bit. Um, it is a great unit, especially when you want to do a lot of mugs at one time. Um, so that's really helpful. A little bit of a downside, you do need a wrap for each mug that you put in the unit. Um, but, you know, it does knock them out and does have them look quite nice. Um, other than that, Jimmy, I think you really covered all the little details regarding the mugs. Um, you know, when, when kind of looking into the mugs and which mug press to purchase, our three-in-one is probably the best deal that we have, um, especially with allowing you to do lattes and large, a large latte or a tumbler. The water bottles do fit in our mug press. You just uh, need a little silicone sheet to wrap around it. Um, so that also gives you that option to, to press that style as well. Yeah, and that, I was impressed with that particular heat, that heat press, that 3-in-1. That, that's a neat unit there. Uh, so anyway, but that's good because that means people have options there. And um, okay, so we definitely, we have some, some questions here. So I'm just going to start down the list. Um, is there a fee for the Creative Studio? No, Creative Studio uh, is part of the Virtuoso sublimation product line. If you're buying any of the, the, really, if you bought a sublimation printer in the last year, then you bought either the SG400 or the SG800, and Creative Studio is included at no charge with those. So when you're purchasing your printer, it's going to come you know, with it. Um, so there is no fee for it. 
can I use an HP inkjet printer on an eight and a half by eleven sublimation paper? Uh, no. Uh, a couple of reasons. Number one, no one is making sublimation ink for HP printers. Okay, uh, and the reason for that is HP printers. Well, one of the reasons, but the HP printer print head. Uh, because it uses heat in the process, uh, it's not going to work for sublimation. So sublimation uh, ink is only produced for a very limited number of uh, off-the-shelf printers because of the characteristics of print heads. And that, that's what really drives it is the technology. Um, in the past, we have supported some uh, Epson units and some Rico units. Uh, and at Sawgrass, we still do make ink for those units. But the reality of what we have out there today, the SG400, SG800, both of which are carried by ProWorld, uh, they're the latest and greatest technology. They are desktop-style printers. And the heads were manufactured specifically with sublimation in mind. And then the inks were manufactured specifically for those heads. So it all works kind of hand in hand. Is it possible to print on black mugs? Sure, you just can't see them. So uh, the, the reality is sublimation does not work on dark colors. Um, and when I say that, I mean, I've actually put some sublimation on a black t-shirt. You really, you could barely see it. It was actually kind of a cool special effect. It was sort of a green on black and it, and, but it, it wasn't something that you could see very well. So the same thing with a black mug. The question is, uh, can you do a black mug? You could, but you're really not going to see it. Now, if you want to create a black mug, then you're simply going to take a white mug. You're going to put in a black background when you create your graphics, and then you're recoloring the mug. The one place you cannot recolor, though, is the handle. So the handle is still going to be white and the area directly underneath it. Uh, but we do see mugs done that way all the time. Uh, so it, it may be acceptable. I just don't know who your customer is and what their expectation is. Um, what is the price on the 3D heat press, Danielle? Uh, let me get that for you. Okay. I should know this off the top of my head, huh? Well, it's, you uh, have a lot of products. So what was that again? <laughs> Seven ninety five. Seven ninety five. Okay. Like I said, you got a lot of products. I wouldn't expect you to remember all that. <laughs> Can you make a glass mug in the three in one if it fits? Um, in theory, you could make anything that if it would fit. The question always with glass is: Is this a glass mug that has a polymer coating to it? Okay, because you cannot sublimate anything that doesn't have a polymer coating or isn't polymer based. Uh, some of the glass mugs that have been produced in the past actually had a sublimatable disc that you sublimated and then it was attached to the glass. Uh, but there are glass products, there are mason jars out there now that have polymer coatings on them. So there are glass products of polymer coating. So that becomes the key. It's got to fit. Okay, that's the other thing. It, it's definitely got to fit. Um, and not every diameter of every cylindrical item fits every you know, heat mug press. When adding multiple mugs, is it required to increase the heat or time? No. If you're using the wrap system in a convection oven, just read the instructions from the wrap manufacturer. Uh, but it normally it does not require, because the heat's consistent, it normally doesn't require increased heat or increased time. Uh, with any given system, you would be experimenting. They'll give you a range on time, because keep in mind, you don't. if you're using a convection oven, you have atmospheric heat around the products, as opposed to forced against it when you're using a heat press. So the reality is how intense is that heat and don't be opening the door and peeking, you know, like people do with the cookies. You don't want to do that with this because you're letting all the heat out. So they're definitely, that's why there's time ranges like 12 to 15 minutes and you have to experiment to see how it works best for your system. Jimmy, if I can jump in, for the yes. 3D vacuum press, you do need to increase um, for each mug. It's estimated between one to two minutes for extra each mug that you uh, put in the system. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How do you prevent blowout on mugs using mug wraps? It's the same thing. You, you wrap your transfer first, uh, then you put your blowout sheet around, and then you put your mug wrap on, uh, over that. Can you use an Epson C88 printer with sublimation ink? Um, 
the C88 is actually a fairly old printer. So it's a very old printer platform. Uh, the quality of the heads is not really today's generation. If you're going to do sublimation, I would strongly consider the SG400 or the SG800. Um, those are the latest generation. That means that you're going to get actually HD quality printing. Uh, sublimation inks that were produced for the C88, um, they are not HD quality. There are several generations back because of the older technology platform involved with it. Uh, so I would not, we have a lot, in fact, we're seeing a lot of C88 people, you know, actually not use those printers anymore and move into newer ones just because they're getting faster prints, they're getting better quality prints, they're getting more efficient use of the ink, all the things that come with a new generation. Um, and when you really look at the price for, say, a SG400 startup kit, it's not a whole lot more than, you know, some of the C88s and it's going to be a better printer under warranty and all those other nice things that you would look for on a brand new system. There are some mugs in the market that interact with heat so when you put hot drinks in the photos show up. Um, I don't know and, and Daniel maybe you do, I don't know if that's available for sublimation. I'm aware of those mugs but I'm not sure if they're sublimation mugs or not. I don't know either for that one. We don't have those. We don't have that product, so we've never tested. Yeah, I think that that's using a special ink, and the ink the ink is heat activated, so that you see a different image when it gets hot, uh, and that wouldn't be the case with sublimation. So I'm pretty sure that's not available for sublimation, but that just the range of what I know about it. Uh, question about the cost of inks, how long does it generally last? Um, sublimation ink is less than a penny per square inch. Uh, if you're buying the any of the new generation printers, it's anywhere from a half a cent to three quarters of a cent per square inch. So it, it's not very expensive application wise. How much you get out of a cartridge depends on what types of you know images you're printing, how much you know area coverage you have, things of that nature. Um, the all ink cartridges have a use by date on them. Uh, it's like anything else that you know over time it will start to degrade. Uh, typically, when you're purchasing ink, your use by date is probably going to be uh, in in the nine to to twelve month range, somewhere around that. Okay, uh, so you know the best use for ink is to use it. I mean, inks that sit over time, uh, you know, are going to um, start to degrade, but typically you're going to get close to a year. And look at the use by date, and that's why I tell people when you get ink, look at the use by date, so you know when it is. Uh, also, with and this is an important distinction too, with the new printers, with the SG400, SG800 versus the C88 that someone mentioned, those both those printers have an automated maintenance function in them, which means when you leave ink in there but you're not printing. Uh, you periodically need to clean the heads, and it does it automatically for you. You set up the maintenance cycles, and it will do what's called a head check periodically, as long as you leave it turned on and plugged in. Uh, and it will use a little bit of ink when it does that. It won't use much, but it will use a little bit of ink uh, you know, doing that. But that will preserve the heads. If you don't have a system, if you have an older system that doesn't have a maintenance system on there, you do have to manually do head checks uh, at least weekly, maybe more often, depending on uh, the product you know that you're actually using. Uh, a question about how long a cartridge lasts with the SG400. Uh, it really comes down to what you're printing and that will determine how long it lasts. There is no set, you know, you get this many prints because every print has a different size, it has a different concentration of color, and you have to keep in mind that it's four colors of ink. It's cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, and you're using combinations, different percentages of those base colors to create a range of about 640,000 different color variations. So it's, you can't really say, how much you're going to use up of any one color because it depends on the colors that you're printing. So I know people, myself, want to know, well, how many prints can I get with a cartridge? We don't know an exact number because there are so many variables in there, it's not predictable. Bottom line is when you look at it, uh, we do know that you're getting, you know, less than a penny per square inch cost-wise, you know, if you're printing somewhere between half a cent and three quarters of a cent, depending on which printer you bought. Um, that's you know pretty much the best math that we have on that. 
What type of heat press if I want to do other items such as plates? Uh, we just call that a flat press. And there's many different flat, flat press options available out there. Uh, and that's something that Danielle and the staff at Pro World can help you find what's the right one for your uh, needs. You know, and that's a big question is finding out what are your needs and then using, um, you know, using that information to figure out what's the best one for you. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share a little information today. I appreciate all the great questions. Uh, and if you have additional questions, please contact uh, the, the wonderful people over there at Pro World. Feel free to you know, email me as, as well. Um, that's what we're here for. So, Danielle, thanks for having me out today and look forward to doing some more with you guys in the future. Great. Thanks for, ha well, thanks for hosting and thanks for everybody for joining us.